Let's talk about precast concrete, catch basins, and manholes. So these are just some uh, photographs of what a catch basin looks like. Basically, catch basins, they're typically uh, rectangular or square, although they can be round. They don't have to be this shape. Uh, but what, the way you can tell it's a catch basin is an open grate on top and allows water to get into the, inside the structure. Now, these structures are watertight. They will have holes on the side of them that allow pipes to enter to convey or take the water out to the sides. Um, here you can see an example of a round catch basin. Catch basin just means that it captures the water and then it pipes it someplace else. Here's another example as well. Uh, these are some precast structures that are just uh, waiting to be delivered to a job site. Uh, they look to be about 4x4x4, four by four by four, but they do get pretty large in size as you can see here. Uh, if you take, take an idea, that person's probably about 5 foot tall at least. Here's a catch basin that's going to be uh, you know, 10, 10 feet plus in height. You can make them linear, uh, similar to trench drains. Um, they Many times they'll have footings attached to them that'll make it wider so they don't sink into the ground. So a lot of, a lot of options with them. Uh, I do want to make mention of these rungs that you see on side of these manholes. These are ladder rungs. They are not there for you to uh, go inside. Okay, We see them better here. The purpose of them is that if you accidentally fall into a manhole, or more importantly, if a child falls into a manhole, they can climb out. But if you're accessing a manhole, you should never use these rungs because they're sitting in water all the time. They are steel and they can corrode and fall under uh, the weight of your body walking on them. So only use them as an escape mechanism. You should have a ladder to enter or exit a manhole uh, properly. So those are the manholes. That's pretty much uh, all of the kind of interesting stuff on those. We'll look at some more details later. I'm sorry, catch basins, not manholes, catch basins. Manholes are a little bit different. Manholes are designed, and they're typically round, to act as a junction point or a location where the pipe can change direction. Um, so in this case, the water can come in on this side, it'll exit out the back, uh, but we can place these holes on any side or any, any distance apart that we need to. Depending on how deep you need to go, they are stackable. Here we can see how the pipes enter into one side. This is a place where pipes change size, so it's likely entering at a smaller diameter, exiting at a larger diameter. You can see those rungs. Again, they're safety uh, measures to get out, not to get in. Here we have a very tall manhole, so the pipe water is coming in at a very low elevation, but that's got to be up at grade. There's a top slab above that. And when we look at manholes, you typically don't have any uh, casting above it that will allow water to enter. So they're typically going to be solid covers uh, above those. All right, but we do want to make sure they're there to, to change junction. This one is for sanitary sewers. It allows flow from many different locations coming in. That's the sumps of them, but we'll talk about sumps uh, at a later date because uh, it's not really quite uh, what we need to talk about just yet. But let's get a little bit more into the details of what these look like by going to New York State DOT standard sheets. So there's four standard sheets that we're going to take a look at, and there's a lot of information on here. Don't get uh, worried by the volume of information on here. I'm going to break it down to some very simple uh, parts. So what the DOT does, New York State DOT does, is they've put together some very generic looking uh, details. And this one in particular, the rectangular drainage structure, uh, shows a top slab, there's casting above it, there's a top slab, and then we have sections of the catch basin to allow uh, to be stacked to different heights that are necessary. The width and height it will vary on these depending on the depth that that pipe is going to be installed in the ground. But if water is coming in through the top, then it's considered to be a catch basin. If it is a sealed cover, uh, then it's just considered a manhole. Uh, there's really the only difference between them structurally. Pipes, we like the pipes to be at the very bottom of the uh, manholes whenever possible. And we also pour what's called a formed invert or a sump. So after the pipe's been installed, someone's got to go down uh, with the proper protective gear uh, attached to a harness on a tripod so they could be reeled out if necessary. And what they're going to do is they're going to place concrete on the bottom of that drainage basin. And this way they slope it so any water that falls on the sides is forced into the pipe. The reason we do that 
is we want the basins to be self-cleaning and we also want, don't want to trap any standing water inside the manholes or catch basins. If we have standing water in there, there's a very good chance that mosquitoes will breed. So it's very important to get those uh, formed inverts placed in the basins. Uh, what else can I show you that's really kind of important on here? Um, all this other stuff you see on the right-hand side, a lot of text, that's the specifications on there. And it also talks about the uh, how they pay for these structures. So you can pull, these details will be available on Blackboard. You can pull them up and look through them at your own leisure, but it's not anything critical to worry about uh, looking into right now. In terms of designing the reinforcing for it, because this is a concrete structure, that's a little bit difficult. Uh, so what the DOT's done is they've given you standard details they tell you exactly what type of reinforcing, how much and where it has to go, depending on the size and shape of your uh, catch basin or manhole cover. What we see on the upper left is this is a square, or we'll call it a rectangle because it could be longer than it is wide, uh, catch basin. So there's an opening that's left on top for the casting to go on top of that. We also have round ones are typically uh, left for uh, manholes and this happens to be a square manhole but they could be round as well. All the reinforcing has been called out depending on the uh, the distance it has to span. So the DOT has done a great job of figuring all that stuff out. So you as a site designer only have to really pick out uh, where the basins go and the depth of them. The actual structural integrity is something that's left up to the manufacturer. And if you're going to call out a New York State DOT structure, which is, is recommended, uh, it's already taken care of for you. In fact, there's an entire page here dedicated to all the reinforcement that has to go into it. So it's all there if you ever uh, want to come up with your, the reinforcing schedules. We see on uh, the last sheet here, sorry it's bouncing around so much, are just some other examples of structures where the castings go directly on top of the basins. So in a, as a cost-saving measure, uh, people have figured out that if they make the side walls of the catch basin or manhole the exact same size as the casting that goes on top of it, they don't need a top slab. So that can save several hundred dollars to several, you know, to a thousand dollars or more per structure that's being in, uh, installed. The catch, because there's always a catch to it, is you got to be really careful when you're building these things, uh, installing them, because the elevations have to work out perfect. If you don't get the structure to hit perfectly, you are allowed to put up to two layers of brick and mortar to adjust the height of that casting, but no more than two layers of that. The reason why we don't want more than two layers is if you start creating too tall of a chimney, you can't get a ladder. Let me try drawing this in, see if this will work. Let's see. Nope, this is a web page. Can't draw on there, but um, you can't have a. You could get a ladder to fit in there. We'll. I'll show you that as an example a little bit later. So that's really it for manholes and catch basins, uh, where they're what their use is for and where they're what they what they look like. Um, basically, it's boxes and cylinders that allow pipes to come in and come out, and uh, water comes in, water goes out. And, and they're not really sized on capacity. It's more just a function of does the pipe fit inside of it. You know what? There's one thing I can tell you about real quick. Get a quick page up here. And let me talk about spacing of these things. So this is always... I wish we were doing this live because it's a little bit more fun to talk about it uh, in a classroom setting, but we'll make this work. Okay, so let's say we have a... This would be a catch basin, and we have a manhole, and we have another uh, manhole. Let's put a catch basin over here, and we'll put a, you know, let's move it over to the side of it. Let's put a manhole there. And we'll put a, I got my terms mixed up, a catch basin and a manhole. So, water goes in, 
water goes in, water goes in. Now let's talk about the pipes between them. So this would be considered a drainage network. So can you have pipes that come out at less than a 90 degree angle? Absolutely. They just have to be straight. They can't be curved because the pipe's made of concrete, doesn't bend at all. So what's the maximum distance you can have between any two structures? Take a guess. Nope, guess higher. Higher. A little too high, go lower. Okay. Keep that number in mind. Let's talk about cleaning these things out. And if you think I'm jumping around, I'm not. So in a plan view, I'm sorry, an elevation view, there's our catch basin. Here's what my manhole would look like. Okay, we'll cover on top. We'll do another manhole underneath here. Do, 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 do. And that's, that's good. So what will happen is, if this is my low, lower point, pipe goes like that, pipe goes like that, we will pour a formed invert on the bottom so that no water sits inside of these things. And water is going in that direction, like that. This is going to be in the way. And see, ground surface looks something like that. Okay. So now let's go forward to wintertime, December. Actually, no, let's go in the springtime, somewhere in March, April, around this time of year. Um, what's going to happen is you're going to have trucks come in that want to clean out these systems. And what it's going to do, it's going to grab all the leaves that accumulate during the fall. They get trapped inside the basins. Those are going to get uh, have to be sucked out, as well as all the sand from salting of the, uh, the roads that occurs. The way we do that is we take a truck... Uh, looks something like that. It's got a big cylinder on the back, like a big. And these are called vac trucks, okay. And on top of these vac trucks, there's also I gotta erase these. Also, there's kind of this almost like a boom, this metal tube, and on there, um, it'll have a hose that will go down inside and suck out all the garbage that's inside the bottom of that. All right, so that vac truck is going to suck all that stuff out. How do we get all that garbage trapped in there? Well, on the front of the truck is this hose reel. And on there, there's a hose, and that hose, if I just draw what the end nozzle looks like, it's got a nozzle on it kind of like this, and it kind of looks like almost like an umbrella end. And the idea behind it is that when they put this hose into it, they try and sneak it into the uh, pipes. Trying to push a hose is very difficult. So what they do is they turn on the water and the water pressure shoots out and forces this hose to kind of jet itself all the way to the end of the pipe. Once that's done, then they uh, change the pressure on that hose and it becomes more of a spray and it kind of opens up almost like an umbrella. And now what's happening is as they drag it back, this spray is scraping and cleaning all the garbage down to the lowest point along with water. So this will fill up with a whole bunch of garbage and the water will then drain out to the recharge basin. How much line do you think they have on that? How much hose do you think they have on the truck? They have enough to clean 350 feet of pipe. So what's the max distance we put between any structure? 350 feet. That's the reason for it. There's no other reason other than that's how much line the, the trucks carry. So when you're spacing these out, you got to make sure you have a structure every 300 feet or less. All right. Let's move on to the next part. Now we're gonna take a look at the drainage pipe. And there's two basic types of pipe that we're gonna be dealing with during drainage design. 
That's going to be the HDPE. That stands for high density polyethylene pipe. Typically it's a black corrugated plastic. Uh, and that's where that term CPP comes from, corrugated plastic pipe. The corrugations are on the outside. It gives some strength to the pipe. It's not uh, corrugated on the inside. Uh, that's one type of pipe. The other type of pipe we're gonna look at is a RCP, which is a round concrete pipe. That's precast concrete. Uh, there's many different styles to that. Uh, they have different classifications, but we're gonna be dealing with just a generic RCP and we're gonna look at the different diameters that are with it. Now, if I were to show you the two pieces of pipe and we usually pass these around the, the classroom, the one thing that's gonna jump out to you is that the plastic pipe is definitely lightweight and the concrete pipe is extremely heavy because plastic is much lighter than, uh, than, than concrete. So there's definitely a weight difference between them. Uh, there's also a smoothness difference between them too. If you were to run your hand on the inside of a concrete pipe, it feels like sidewalk. It's very rough. Over time, as water passes through that with grit and sand that's trapped in there, it does smooth it out a little bit, but generally it stays, it stays pretty rough for the first 15, 20 years of its, its lifespan. Plastic pipe, however, is very smooth and it stays that way uh, continuously. Uh, because there's differences in how smooth the pipe is, we get differences in what's called the roughness coefficients. That, that's that N value that we look at. And we'll get to where we, we pick up those numbers from, but they do change based on the type of pipe that you're designing for. So you always have to be aware of what type of pipe you're gonna use. And that's something that is dictated by the municipalities. The specific pipe manufacturer will have a N value that they recommend to use for their pipes. However, the municipalities also have the ability to uh, change that N value based on what they think is the best option. So the first thing I wanna talk about is the size of the pipe. So this is the specification, uh, the copy, this is up on Blackboard for ADS, uh, I believe it stands for American Drainage Systems. It's probably one of the most popular pipes out there. Their N12 pipe. And their pipe comes in several different sizes. So some of them are good and some are not good. Uh, they go, uh, we have four inches all the way up to 60 inches. Now, generally, we're going to stay in this range, the 15 to 60 inch range. The ones down here are generally too small to be commercially uh, beneficial to us. Some people will use the 12 inch. Uh, you will see that actually a lot on site designs, but when we get into the concrete pipe, I'm going to give you an explanation as to why you should always avoid the 12 inch pipe whenever possible. It's not that it's uh, wrong to use it. There's just some problems you run into uh, working with it. So what we're left with is 15, 18, 24, 30, 36, 42, and 48 and 60 on the HDPE pipe. Now, can you get pipe that's made to be 28 inches? Yes, certain manufacturers do make that, but this particular one doesn't. Pipe is generally gonna be sized in three inch increments. Um, so you'll see like 18, some places will even carry a 21, uh, I'm sorry, not 28, 27 is another one that you can see it. some companies will make it, 33, uh, 39, 45. And then after that, we generally skip from 48 uh, up to about, what's that gonna be, uh, 54 inches. We go up about six inches on that. But again, each manufacturer makes their own. So those are the general sizes. <clears throat> What's going to happen is as you go through the design process, you're going to get numbers such as uh, 22.5 inch pipe. And you're going to have to decide, do I round it up or do I round it down? Uh, you can do either one of them. But when you do that, it does create uh, differences in the way that the design goes. And we'll get into that later on. So let's take a look at the RCP. Uh, this is also going to be up on Blackboard for you as well. This is a catalog cut from American Concrete Products, and they have their reinforced, I'm sorry, this is the uh, page. They have their reinforced concrete pipe, and it meets all of these different ASTM standards, but their numbers go from 12 inch all the way up to 120 inch. Now, just to give you some scale, 120 inch diameter pipe is a 10 foot diameter pipe. Uh, you can actually drive uh, vehicles inside these pipes. 
These are used for massive, massive drainage projects. Uh, not very common to see these being used, but they, they are out there. Uh, here on Long Island, the biggest pipe you're probably going to run into is probably about 60 inches. That's, that's a five foot diameter pipe. That's massive. But the majority of what we deal with here on Long Island in that 18 to 36 range, sometimes you get up into the 48 range, uh, but that's a big, big pipe. That's a lot of water we're dealing with. So let's talk about why we don't want to use a 12 inch diameter pipe. Okay, so with a pipe that's 12 inches in diameter, I gotta sketch this out a little bit better. Okay. Okay. I call it the dead cat rule. And basically what happens is when cats are getting ready to die, they go off and they find some place to die where no one uh, finds them. Um, this can work with raccoons or any other small animal like that. These things tend to go inside the pipes. And what happens when they die, uh, their bodies swell up and they block off the pipes. So because of that, if you go with the 18 inch diameter, they don't usually swell to 18 inches in diameter. Uh, they do swell large enough to close up at 12, but not usually the 18. They usually pop before that. Uh, also, with the 12-inch diameter pipes, you can get things like uh, soccer ball, basketball, anything like that that falls into a drainage pipe with a little bit of rocks or leaves or there's twigs. That can jam them up pretty good, too. So for the sole reason of not getting the pipes clogged, stay away from the 12-inch ones. Uh, a lot of site designers don't go by that. They just put them in because it's a cheap uh, installation. I'm more on the, the side of I've seen these pipes clog before and when they do clog it creates a massive backup of water and that's a, uh, a big problem for us. Uh, the reason that's something you have to be aware of is when a pipe clogs uh, the water that winds up flooding into people's property often is not covered by insurance. So you have to be aware that you're going to have, uh, you know, lawsuits dealing with claims like that. So put a bigger pipe in. You don't have to worry about those things. So remember that 12 inch dead cat rule. <clears throat> it's a horrible thing, but people never forget that. So last thing I want to talk about with pipe is your end values. And this is right out of the town of Brookhaven specifications. And it says that we're going to use 0 0.015 for a uh, reinforced concrete pipe that's 18 inches or smaller. And if we go to a 24 inch or larger, you use 0.13. And then for your HDPE pipes, we use 0.013. Why the difference between them? The smaller the roughness coefficient, the faster the water goes. So the roughness coefficient, you can think of it as a measure of how rough the material is. The bigger the number, the rougher it is. So things like earthen ditches, that's a very, very rough material that's going to slow the water down, cause it to be a little bit more turbulent type of flow. Uh, that'll slow the water and slow the speed down. While I do have this up, uh, I just want to bring it to your attention that town of Brookhaven keeps their velocity between 2 and 10 feet per second. Most other municipalities work between 2 and 8 feet per second, but Brookhaven's got to be different. They always, always have to do things a little bit uh, different. So other than that, that kind of takes care of what we need to talk about with pipe. I do have some videos you're gonna watch after this. Uh, there are some links on YouTube on the PowerPoint. They're gonna show you the installation of HDPE pipe and also a couple installations on concrete pipe. And I want you to watch those with the understanding of, you'll see why HDPE is more popular because you're putting in these longer sections versus the concrete pipe that takes uh, a lot more uh, effort to get the same distance in as well. And the last video in that segment is going to be how we install it using a pipe laser. Uh, the pipe laser is a, a surveying tool that we use to align the pipe. So we make sure we're keeping it on the proper pitch the entire way through there. So watch those and then we'll move on to the, to the uh, next topic after that.